You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, life changing, life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. Ephesians chapter 1. I want to hang out now. Let me just read into your hearing. And we're still teaching on this whole issue of settling struggle with identity. Setting, uh, uh, settling the struggle with identity. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. We dealt with that last week, verse two. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. I'm, I'm gonna stop right there and I'm gonna tell you why, because this, this text can run away with you. Everybody type this in, say this with me, self-esteem. Say this with me, identity. Say this with me, confidence, in Christ. Say this with me, self-worth. Today, I want to make sure that we are operating in our self-worth, our confidence in Christ. And, and, and so I want to lift up a couple of significant points, really two, maybe three, depending on how far. And I want to tell you, take some notes because I'm telling you, this is going to be impactful for us. The first thing that I really want to hang out and spend some time talking about today is this issue of understanding the source of my blessings. Understanding how we rely on the source of our blessings. It is so easy for us to read through things in the scriptures and miss really what they're ultimately teaching us. And I think oftentimes that happens here in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, first of all, so as I can rightly divide this word, I want you to understand that when the Apostle Paul penned this under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, this is actually, had, had, had he been in an English class, he would have probably flunked. And the reason is because in the ancient literature, Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3 all the way down to verse 14, you heard me right, from verse 3 all the way down to verse 14, literally is one unbroken sentence in the original language. And, and, and so literally, as Paul writes this, it is just a run on ongoing sentence. And, and so he opens up here, Ephesians chapter one, beginning at verse three, with the longest single sentence in ancient literature. And when you and I begin to study it, the way it's broken down is verses three through six describe the will of the father. Everybody say the will of the father. And then verses seven through 12, he's going to talk about the work of the son. And then in verses 13 and 14, he's going to describe the witness of the spirit. Now, 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 this is important because he begins his dialogue with us stating a theme. Verse three, he states a theme. And then he highlights the rest of it, verses 4 all the way through 14. He highlights everything that's going to come as a result of that theme that he shared with us. The verse says to us, God has blessed us. Everybody say, God has blessed me. I want you to get this. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in Christ the heavenly places. Now notice twice, verse two, he says, grace to you and peace from God. Everybody say our father, 
our Father. And then in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God, everybody say, and Father. And Father. This is significant because he's saying the source of the blessing is God the Father. Now, 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 this is major. This is major. Be, be, because, because, first of all, let's understand when he says he's blessed us with every uh, spiritual blessing, what does spiritual mean? And, and so let's unpack that first. When he says he's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then, by the way, he encourages us to praise him for that. And I want to, when we get done teaching Bible study today, we're going to be praising God for every spiritual blessing he has already prepared for us. Y'all, the, the, word, the word spiritual here could mean one of two things, but I want to focus on one of these two possible meanings. The word spiritual could mean he has blessed us by means of the Holy Spirit. When we read verses 11 through 14, it would suggest that that is legitimate interpretation. He's blessed us in spiritual, uh, spirit, given us spiritual blessings. It could mean that he's blessed us by the Holy Spirit, by the means of the Holy Spirit. Or it could mean, and this is where I want to part, it could mean that he has blessed us with spiritual rather than material blessings. Everybody say spiritual rather than material. Now, now this is important because we live in a, a society where oftentimes we deem material blessings as more important than spiritual blessings. We, we tend to think of the things God gives us. Rarely are we honoring him for the spiritual blessings. And, and I want to challenge us today. I'm about to say something that I think is going to bless us. Family, I want to suggest to you that the means of greater physical blessings is beginning or the means of greater material blessings is having an appreciation more for spiritual blessings. If you and I will begin caring more for spiritual blessings than we do for material blessings, God will indeed reward us with those material blessings. Um, so let me give you some examples. Um, are you more concerned about a scratch on your car or a soul going to hell, right? And so am I more concerned about the spiritual side or am I more concerned about the physical side? Um, or am I more concerned about missing worship service or missing a birthday party? Spiritual versus material. Um, Bible study, oftentimes, you know, we have it at 12 noon, you know, so people have to choose between a study and a snack. What's more important to me? Is it more important that the church is not growing or my garden is not growing? Is it more important to me that my Bible is not opened or my email is not opened? I think oftentimes we miss that what God focuses on for us as believers is he wants us to care about spiritual blessings. Now, this is important because what he says here is, and, and this is the source. Everybody say the source. I'm getting to the source. He says the source of them of these blessings is God the Father. Now, now, what he's saying is, it is the will of my Father in heaven to bless us. This is where Paul begins. See, it does not matter who wants to curse you. What matters is who wants to bless you. It doesn't matter who has negative to say about you. What matters is who wants to bless you. He says, I want you to get something straight. You are not homeless. You are not by yourself. You are not without a family structure and support. You have a God, the Father, who wants to be the source of every blessing in your life. This is a massively supreme revelation of who God is. Don't miss this because we can, we can read right over this. Grace to you and peace from God. Everybody say our Father. Matter of fact, say my Father. My father, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is important because we don't oftentimes talk about God the father, but let's talk about this for a moment. This is distinctly New Testament revelation. Think about Old Testament revelation about who God is. I'm going somewhere. 
when we start looking and talking about New Old Testament revelation of who God is, God initially is revealed as Elohim, the creator. And then God is revealed as the covenant, the God of covenant, which is Jehovah. And then he is revealed as Lord, Adonai. And then as El, the Almighty. And then El Shaddai, the gracious giver. And then all of the, all of the manifestations we know of Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. The Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of all peace. Je Jehovah Sabaoth, uh, the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Tzitkanu, the Lord of our righteousness. Jehovah Shammai, the Lord who is there. Now watch this. It is not until Jesus comes in the New Testament that we are given a full revelation of God, of God as Father. Remember, when Jesus first spoke, first thing he says in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, around the 49th verse, Jesus says, Do you not know that I must be about my Father's business? That, that the first words recorded of Jesus. Uh, in, in the, the greatest parable, the parable of the prodigal son, in Luke chapter 15, Father is recorded over and over again, almost a dozen times. When Jesus is at the Garden of Gethsemane, it's Father that is on his lips. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. As he hung on the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Y'all, and, and, and as he walked on the Olivet Road on the day of ascension, he is referencing Father. When we are taught to pray, it begins with our Father. I'm going somewhere. The part of the reason I should never struggle with my identity, uh, I should never struggle with my self-esteem, I should never struggle with my confidence in Christ. I want you to get this. It's who, because of who my Father is. Y'all, we serve a God who is present. We serve a God who is not distant. We serve a God who desires to be knowable. We serve a God. We don't think like the Stoics think. We serve a God that has the ability to feel. We serve a God that has emotions. We serve a God that is not apathetic. And we have to recognize, I am not, oh, I got you. Oh, please get this in your spirit. Say this of yourself. I am lacking nothing. And the reason I am lacking nothing is because I serve a God who is a father. I am being fathered, I am being protected, I am being covered. And so he begins by making two statements about God the Father. And I want you to hold on to that as we live out this next year of our life, as we do the work that God calls us to do, as we love our family and our friends, when we feel like people have detached from us, people have left us, people have abandoned us, I want us to hold on to the fact that the, that the source of my blessings is God the Father. Ooh, let me tell you why you should be shouting. Folk can leave, but the source stays intact. Other things can dry up, but the source of my blessings stays intact all the time. Paul says, what I'm about to share with you is about the source. First of all, the source of your blessing is God the Father. Now, now, what he now does, and I'm about to mess with some of our theology, man. What he does is Paul now moves and gives us the scope. Everybody say the scope. He gives me the scope of my blessings. Now notice this. Blessed be the God and Father, I'm at verse 3, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. Everybody say it's past tense. Who has blessed us in Christ. Now watch the scope. With every, everybody say every, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Notice what he says. He says, everything you need, you have already been given. Now, can I mess with your theology? I'm going to read it one more time because some of you are going to struggle because you've been like, oh, wow, I'm convicted. I've been getting this wrong. Who has blessed us? Everybody say past tense. Who has blessed us in Christ. Are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Then I'm talking about you. Who has blessed us, past tense, in Christ. Watch this. With every spiritual blessing. Now this is hard. How many of us 
have in our moment of going through what we're going through, how many of us have said stuff like, God, I just need more patience. Come on, come on, let me, come. can I come get you? How, how many of us have, have said, God, I need more love? How, how many of us have said, God, I need more endurance? God, I need more discipline. God, I need more kindness. God, I need more gentleness. How many times have we functioned as if I don't yet have everything I need? Here's what's, what's tough now. According to Paul in the book of Ephesians, God has already given, past tense, already given. Oh God, that, that means it's not dependent on my performance. It's not dependent on me. He has already done that. Past tense, he's already provided everything I need. Put your hands on yourself. Say, I have everything I need. I want you to understand why this is important. Because God is not unkind. And God would never place me in a situation where I, would, I needed, there was a demand on me for something that he had not already supplied. Let me say that one more time. God is not unkind. He's not going to put you in a situation where you need to be more patient. And, and you're going to need to be more patient, and yet he's not already supplied it. I want you to get this. God never makes a demand on my life that he has not already supplied. And so we have to stop saying as Christians, I need more. I need more patience. I need more favor. I need more kindness. I need more love. That is untrue. And that is not representative of how God, your father, is providing for you. According to this text, he's clearly saying, I have everything I need. If I have everything I need, pastor, what's the problem? The problem is I have not taken advantage of it. The problem is I have not appropriated it. Please understand this. This is the sphere of it. I have everything I need. This is, I want us to understand the scope rather of it. I have everything I need. Living the Christian life is not a matter of me living for God. I'm, I'm deliberately waiting because we're going to struggle. No, it is not a matter of me living for God. It is allow, it's a matter of allowing Christ to live through me. See, I'm in him. And so the issue is not that I have to do. The issue is I have to let what has been put in me show up. And, and, and so we keep trying harder, trying harder, trying harder. It's not a matter of patience. It's, allow, it's a matter of allowing his patience to take control and flow through me. It's not a matter of you loving, but allowing his love to flow through me. This is why I've got to be careful that I don't let folk shut me down and stop me up and keep me from flowing. Everybody say I have to keep flowing. I have to keep flowing because if I don't, I'm going to get stuck in my own energy. I have to keep flowing because if I don't, I'm going to be stuck in my own efforts. And some of us, as I teach today, are swore, slam, wore out. You are wore out because you have been stuck in your own energy. You're wore out because you've been stuck in your own influence. You've been stuck in your own efforts. And God is speaking to us saying that it's important that we recognize that, that we are just the channel by which the power of God flows through us. So are you getting this? I want us to see the value of this, the importance of this, the significance of this. This is important because, because the source of my spiritual blessing is God the Father. And, and, and the scope of it is I already have everything I need, which is where the bulk of my teaching takes us. The bulk of my teaching is going to take us to verse 4 and 5. Because I know what you're thinking if you're, if you're one of my A students. What you're thinking is, well, pastor, if I already have all the patience that, that I need, if I already have all the gentleness I need, if I have all the favor I need, where is it? Well, the text tells us. The text tells us that there are two spheres. That's where I want to spend the rest of my, that's all my teaching time are, is, is on the spheres of these blessings. Where do I find it? The, the spheres of blessings, and by the way, blessings and battles are found in the same place. That's a great word for somebody. 
blessings and battles are found in the same place. That's why some of us don't have the blessings we could have because in order to get them, I need the battle. Let me park here for a moment. We just, we just finished studying the book of Joshua, right? Whether or not you realize it, uh, Ephesians is the New Testament counterpart to Joshua. The reason Ephesians is the New Testament counterpart to Joshua is because just as in the book of Joshua, when, do you remember the children have gotten into the promised land? That's where the blessings were, right? But even though they were in the promised land, the promised land wasn't just handed over to them. Do you remember enemies being there? Do you remember battles having to be fought there? This is what Ephesians is teaching us. In Christ and in heavenly places are every spiritual blessing I need. However, the blessings have been placed in Christ in, spirit, in heavenly places. And because they've been placed in heavenly places, I have to be willing to fight for them. Y'all, y'all, please understand something. The heavenlies, heavenly place. I think a lot of times we think that that's some place where there's no warring there. No, at this present time, Satan's sphere of operation is in the heavenlies. This is why, according to later on, Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to see that he's the prince of the power of the air. He's aided by countless hosts of spirit beings. These spirit beings accept the lordship, little L, of Satan. They follow his lead. So we now have to take the heavenlies by storm, which is why in the book of Ephesians, oh God, this is good. In the book of Ephesians, guess what? I learned to fight. And let me say something to somebody. It's time to learn to fight. You don't need more love in your marriage. You just need to fight for the love that's already been put there. You don't need to fight for more. You don't need to just ask for more discipline. You need to fight for the discipline that's already been given. Everything you need has already been reserved with your name on it by God, your father. But it's been placed in one of two spheres, either in Christ or in a heavenly place. And when it's in a heavenly place, in Christ means I have the, I have the position of it. But in heavenly places means I have to I have to be willing to fight for it. And let me say this to somebody to encourage you. And if, if you're receiving this, type this in. Despite what the enemy looks like, he is already defeated. I'm going to say that one more time. Despite what the enemy looks like, he is already defeated. One more time for the people in the back. Despite what the, see, I'm, 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 I'm in, I'm giving you the parallelism now of the Old Testament book of Joshua and the New Testament book of Ephesians. In the Old Testament, do you remember they went to scout out the promised land? And do you remember that there were giants in the land, at least in their perception? And do you remember that they came back with a report to say, we can't take the giants? And so they had to wander for all those years. And it took Joshua and Caleb to say, no, no, no. We can take the giant, but they didn't think they could take the giant because they were intimidated by what the enemy looked like. And I want to speak this over somebody's life. You have been given blessings, spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And it looks like you can't overcome the cancer. It looks like it's bigger than you. It looks like the marital infidelity you can't recover from. It looks like the thing you're struggling with you can't get on the other side of. I'm here to speak this prophetically over your life. Whatever the enemy looks like, it is already defeated. That enemy is already defeated. I just have to learn now how to combat, how to war in heavenly places. We got to storm the heavenly place. That's why prayer is so important. We have prayer three times a week. We're storming heavenly places. Oh, God. This is why when we lay hands on people that are sick, we're storming heavenly places. This is why you anoint your children. Everybody say storm heavenly places. Because there, there, is, there, there, are, there are spirit demons operating all around us. This is why we must pray for, for Christian nationalists and why we must pray uh, for racists and why we must pray for those stuck in the throes of prejudice and why we must pray uh, for Antifa and pray uh, for groups of people that have have a posture of hatred and seduction and bitterness and anger because ultimately we wrestle. Come on here, Bible readers. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the air. And so understand what he's teaching us, y'all, that there's already 
Everybody say already. I want you to get this. So you didn't lose your blessing. You don't have to work harder for your blessing. Your father has already put it aside in advance, oh God, of what you did wrong. See, you, let me help you understand something. Part of the reason we miss our blessings when we sin is not because, oh God, Lord, this is such a good word. Part of the reason we miss our blessings when we sin is not because God has now taken the blessing. It is because we have diluted or watered down our ability now to fight for the blessing that has already been provided. So when I'm sinning, I'm weak. When I'm sinning, I'm not, I'm not fighting my best fight. And until I can storm heavenly places, I'll never fully be able to appropriate every spiritual blessing. You, you heard it in the text, right? Every spiritual blessing that God has provided. Now, let me say a few things about this. Um, I, I, I want you to jot down some points here. Because if God has already done this, he's done this before I was even born. See, God has, this is what, again, remember, we're talking about identity. We're talking about self-esteem. We're talking about confidence in Christ. Stop thinking you're less than someone else because you don't have all the tools they have. You, come on, everybody say me. You have already been given every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Past tense, you have already been given it. I want to say some things so we really understand the value of this because this is going to help us. Here's the first thing I want you to see as it relates to the truth of this, of this word. God designed me before I was born. Everybody say, God designed me before I was born. And, and I'm going to say this to somebody who feels like your parents never wanted you. Your parents may not have wanted you, but God did. That, that's why I would encourage somebody who's even listening to me teach right now, if you're on the borderline, you're considering an abortion. I believe the Lord has you on watching Bible study right now to say, don't do it. You, you're, you're saying, you know what? I didn't plan for this pregnancy. And the Lord is saying, don't abort that baby. And the reason the Lord is saying, don't abort that baby is because the Lord wants you to know that the Lord has already designed the baby before the baby was even born. Come on, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. So, so, so I want you to understand the value of this. Because I've already been given, I'm talking about this identity. I'm talking about this self-esteem, this confidence in Christ. God has already designed me before I was born. He already knew every blessing I was going to need. He already knew what was going to be necessary for my life in order for me to fully honor him and obey him. Y'all, y'all, there, there, there's, there, there's a mystery going on here. Let me, God, oh, I hope the Holy Ghost will let me teach this right. There's a mystery that we need to understand in this text. And here's the struggle, why we have a hard time understanding this sometimes. Because it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. The problem is we tend to see ourselves and define ourselves as finite, where God is infinite. Right? He's infinite. He's infinite. We are finite. We have a clear stop, middle, start. God is from everlasting to everlasting. So because we are creatures of time, finite, and God is a creature of eternity, understand something, we express our mode of being as finite beings, as beings that are creatures of time. We express our being in three tenses. We either express our being from a I was, a I am, right? I was, past, right? I am who I currently am, or I will be what's going to happen in my future. God expresses his mode of being in the eternal present, which means he had, he's not an I was, I am, I will be. God is a I am, and I am, and a I am. This is why 
Jesus in John chapter 8. It, he says, before Abraham was. He doesn't say, before Abraham was, I was. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Right? He was claiming eternity of being and coexistence with the Father. Pastor, why does all this matter? It matters because you keep letting your past rattle your identity. You keep, you keep focusing so much on your future. You can't focus in on who you really are. You keep focusing on what's happening right now. My circumstance, my coincidence, the thing that's going on in my life. And I'm so caught up on it and so focused on it that we don't recognize God has already decided who you are. Before your mother and father even got pregnant with you, despite all of that, God says, I already have a design for you. It was determined. It was ahead of time. God is teaching us that he's designed me before I was even born. So don't let what parents you were born to shut you down and slow you down. Don't let the mistake you made as a teenager keep you from being everything that God has called you to be. Don't allow that, that failed marriage or that, or that, or that, 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 that sickness or, or that bankruptcy or, or that hardship. Don't allow the, the, the person who has entered into your life and now has hurt your heart and disappointed you. Don't you dare allow that to change who you are in Jesus Christ. God has designed me before I was even born. And God is not seeing me from an, a finite perspective. He is seeing me from an infinite perspective. And he's looking at who I have always been. Are you getting this? This is why you can't let a mistake rattle your identity and your self-esteem and your confidence in Christ. That, that's why I can, I, can, I can be faithful to God and say, God, forgive me. And he's willing to forgive me and cleanse me from unrighteousness and not steal my blessings or take back my blessings. But to say, boy, you got to make sure you have everything you need to fight in heavenly places to get everything I've appropriated for you. That's the first big concept. God has designed you before your parents even had you. Nothing changes that. But here's the second thing. The second thing about this, I don't know how far I'm going to get in this teaching today. If this is helping. Somebody said this is helping. The second thing is God's design for me is determined by the image God gave me. God's design. You have a design. You have a purpose. You have an identity. It is determined by the image God gave you. It is determined by the image God gave you. You remember Genesis chapter 1 where all this creation is going on? Verse number 26. In Gen Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our own image. Let us make man in our own image. You have been made, I have been made in the image of God. God's design for you is determined not by the labeling of man, but by the image God gave you. Now, this is important. This is important. Everybody say, I need to work on my self-image. I need to work on my self-image. This is really, really significant. Let me say, let me take the word image. And I, I should have time for this. Let me take the word image and let me break down an acrostic for how you and I can begin understanding our image. Here, 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 here's the first word I want you to write down. The first word that I want you to write down is inward. Inward man. The first element, the recipe, what goes into my image is my inward man. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23, guard your heart out of it flows the issue of life. God breathed into me in my nostrils. I became a living being. Right. So the first thing that shapes or forms my self image is my inward man. This is the part of me that is given to me by God. And so when Paul writes to the church at Ephesus that you have been given everything you need in Christ Jesus, everything you need by God, your father, he is saying you do not allow people to, to, to change and to shape who you, how you ultimately identify. He says, your inward man is going to give you insight on how God designed you. That's the first thing. The M stands for my makeup. 
Now, I'm not talking about mascara, eyebrow, lipstick. I'm not talking about that. My makeup, meaning my personality. Right? God has instilled in you a unique personality. Some Most people don't know this about me, but I'm actually an introvert. And it's probably one of the struggles I've had with pastoring and also being an elected official, you know, because my life is as a public personality. But the reality of it is I'm, I'm really an introvert. And so it's hard for me being in public. It's hard for me being around groups of people um, because I'm, I love be, I could just sit home by myself. Right. And, and so we have to recognize the personality that God has given us that some he has made introverts, some he has made extroverts, some he has made analytical people, some he has made feeling people, some he has made warm people. You ever bumped into a person that you know loves Jesus with everything in you, but they just not super warm. It's just something about them. They can be a little, you know, they can just rub, it can be a little bit like sandpaper, a little hard, you know, or, or people that are just so straightforward. You know they're saved, you know they love God, but they don't know how to be different. They just going to tell you about your stuff. That's all they ever do, right? Straightforward. Or some people that are just always happy. Like every time you see them, you just kind of like, really? It's like that again today, right? That's part of their personality, right? And, and, and so this is important because I think oftentimes we feel like I have to be like you in order to be blessed, and God is saying, no, your spiritual blessings are determined by your image, who I have put, what I put in you, by, by your makeup. Because remember, all of my design was created by God before I was even born. So my makeup, right? If you ever wonder, why was I born to these parents? Part of the reason I was born to the parents I was born so that God could use them to help shape my makeup to shape my personality. So my inward man, my makeup, here, here's, here's the third thing. The third thing are my abilities. My abilities determine God's design. My abilities will determine God's spiritual blessings. And, and, and so these are the things I naturally do, the things I naturally understand. Um, you know, I, I, I have an ability to teach. You know, I, I didn't start teaching having had been um, receiving a formal training in teaching per se. Maybe formal training in languages and theology and doctrine and Old Testament, New Testament and counseling and all those things, but not in teaching per se, right? So we all have different abilities and we have to not... Um, covenant one another's abilities. We have to be able to embrace how God has uniquely wired us and designed us, right? So I don't have the ability to sing. Like I don't have the ability to do, I'm not artistic. So God uniquely creates different abilities in us. The G is for gifts, right? Spiritual gifts, some of us, and that's different than abilities. I'm talking about some have this is what I'm given by God in salvation, right? To edify the body, to glorify God. Um, so, so administration and um, discernment and encouragement and uh, evangelism and faith and hospitality and knowledge and leadership and shepherding and prophecy and teaching and serving and showing mercy and wisdom. All of this, right, are gifts. And I think it's important that as we learn what Paul is teaching us about these spiritual blessings in Christ, that we not covet each other's gifts, that we've got to be very grateful for the gifts that God has given us, each of us individually. There's a difference between abilities and talents and gifts, right? Talents are natural. Gifts are supernatural. Talents are inherited from, or my abilities are inherited from my parents. My gifts are received directly from God. Talents are received at birth or abilities are received at birth. Um, gifts are received at the new birth, right? And so, and so that's all a part of how God is creating my image. And then the final thing 
are my experiences. The E stands for experiences. You know, I want to speak this over your life and family. Let's be cautious that we, we not, we're not so quick to talk about what I wish hadn't happened and what I wish I hadn't experienced. I'm learning that we are the sum total of every experience we've had. There, there are things that I experienced in elementary school that now are used in pastoral ministry. There are things that I experienced in middle school that now I use in public office. And if you were to reflect upon your life, your life, there are things that you experienced that have made you into the person you are. Either we believe all things work together for good or we don't. And I want to encourage us that, that, that ultimately the image that we have, please receive this, ultimately the image that we have is determined by God. God's design for me is determined by the image he gave me, right? The inward man, the makeup, the abilities, the gifts, all of this is ultimately determined by who God has made me, um, my experiences. And so all of this is a really important aspect, right, um, of, of how God wires us and how God works in our lives. Um, let, me, let, me say, let me say another thing here. God's design for me will result in energy, confidence, and satisfaction. God's design for me will result in energy, confidence, and satisfaction. I'm selling this issue of struggling with identity. Let me tell you why many of us as believers are slam wore out. We are wore out because we are trying to live out a somebody that God didn't make us. We're wore out because we are trying to become someone else. It is not me operating in my gift that's wearing me out. It is me trying to operate in your gift. It is me forcing certain experiences. It is me trying to act like I have talents I don't have, gifts that I don't have, abilities that I don't have, a makeup and a personality that I don't have. And, and so I, I love how the Amplified Bible references Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 it reads, it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire, both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. God is working in you. He's creating in me. Everybody say he's working in me. Everybody say he's creating in me. He is energizing me in the power and the desire to be who he wants me to be. I, please understand this. The moment we recognize who we are in Christ, the moment we recognize and identify with that person that God has made me, then I will develop an energy and a confidence around that design, around that image, a, a confidence and, and an energy um, around that that label um, around that identity that I can then begin walking in. And so I just want to encourage you, man, not trying to, to, st to stop wearing ourselves out, being who other people want us to be. People didn't design us. People didn't create our image. You know, and we have to be careful that people that are working to help me establish my image. You know, my image is in Christ. My identity is in Christ. And we have to be able to embrace that and hold on to that. Let me say another thing about this. The other thing that I want you to see about this, and this is so important, is that God's design can be missed because of comparing and conforming. I think the issue of acceptance, I want you to get this. Let me, let me give you the point one more time. God's design can be missed because of comparing and conforming. Now, I want you to grab this. I want us to grab this together as a church family. The issue of acceptance has already been resolved beforehand. The issue of acceptance has already been resolved beforehand. 
This is very important. And so, and so I don't need to get acceptance. I've been accepted. I was accepted before I was even born. It means when he says this issue of acceptance is accepted now, accepted in the future, and accepted in all eternity. God is not throwing me away. God is not giving me back. It means accepted forever. It means something that happened in the past that has continuing effect and genuineness in my life right now. We have been accepted in the beloved. And so we have to recognize 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17 tells us that why so many Christians are not living by their design that God has given us is they don't have the energy, the confidence, the satisfaction that God intends for us to have. And we need to retain the place in our life that the Lord has assigned to us by which he has called us. I think one of the greatest reasons we don't find God's will for our lives is we are prone to compare ourselves constantly with other people. God, what you're doing in me and for me, I know is what you want for me. And I'm going to hold on to that. And I'm not going to struggle with this issue of identity anymore. I'm, I'm going a little bit longer. So let me hurry up and finish this last statement. Or maybe one more after this. I'm still talking about this image, this design from God. God's design is the standard. It's the last thing I'm going to say. God's design is the standard by which God will evaluate, will evaluate me one day. Romans chapter 14, we are told, y'all, that we're going to all stand before God's judgment seat. Um, we're going to give an account. We're going to give an account. And let me tell you something. God is not going to judge me by what others expect of me. I'm going to say that one more time. God is not going to judge me by what others expect of me. Let me tell you something. You can disappoint a whole lot of people, but don't disappoint God. God doesn't say that you're going to have to give an account on what others thought you ought be. I'm not going to have to give an account to God on what you think I should be. I'm not going to give an account before God on what you thought I should have said. I'm not going to give an account from before God on who you thought I should have been. Y'all, I'm going to go ahead and kill this demon. Y'all, we have too many folk running around trying to take responsibility for everybody else. Too many folk running around trying to tell everybody else what they ought to be. And we have to recognize that God is not creating people in our lives to walk around in our criticism. And, and they've got some self-appointed perspective that your whole point in life is to give commentary about what is right and what is wrong in my life. At the end of the day, I'm going to stand before God. You're going to stand before God on what he has called you to be. And so, God, I've got to be able to receive and accept and walk in and settle the struggle with my identity. I'm done teaching for the day. I've got so much more. As you can see, Ephesians is going to be loaded. I'm going to get to the practical stuff, but we, we need to work through the doctrine. I'm going to give you some words that I'm going to teach next week. I want you to begin praying over them now. Everybody say, this is everything that I already am. Come on, say it again. This is everything I already am. Let me tell you everything you already are. Already are. Chosen. Predestined accepted, redeemed, forgiven, enlightened, directed. You've been given an inheritance. You are sealed. You are assured. You are quickened. You've been raised. You are saved. You are reconciled. You are unified. You are edified. You are gifted. You are separated. You are strengthened. You already have every spiritual blessing you need. Now is the time I need to go storm the heavenlies and fight for what has already been provided for me. I hope this lesson blessed you today. I hope you share it with someone else. We're going to be teaching all year, most of this year, on, on this issue of being a masterpiece in the making. Everybody put, put your hands on yourself. Say, I'm a masterpiece in the making. And I want us to understand the value and the significance of who you are in Jesus Christ. No more struggling. Say this with me. No more struggling.
over my identity. No more struggling over self-image. No more struggling over a lack of confidence. Everything I need, God the Father has already provided for me even before I was born. Thanks for listening to Orthos. I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe, either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.